this episode of the NLN podcast, Nursing Edge Unscripted, The Surface Track, and thank you for joining us. In this episode, we thought we would talk about the 2022 NLN Summit, and I've got my colleague here, Jenny O'Rourke, and we thought we would debrief together some of the highlights from this past summit, and we had over 1,200 attendees. There was a lot of energy. It took place in Las Vegas. I walked away feeling uh, pretty energized and um, especially some of the uh, keynote and uh, Deborah Spun lectures that we had, uh, I just walked away with these big aha moments and I just thought we could uh, chat and unpack some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, happy to talk through it. It was um, probably as I've I've told you, I know already because we've debriefed um, and I've debriefed with, with a few other colleagues that it was one of the, probably the best, one of the best conferences I've really ever attended. Um, you know, sometimes there's those conferences where you're like, ah, eh, there's parts of it are good, parts of it not so good. This one, there was, it was just amazing from start to finish. Um, and I, I'm hearing that from my colleagues too. So I don't think it's just my perspective, but plus, right. It was one of the largest ones. We had a huge attendance, which was great. Yeah, definitely. And I think I, I agree with you, Jenny, that, um, it was even kind of like bookended by some really great uh, speakers. And then of course, with the uh, concurrent sessions in between, yeah, it was like you, you got some really good nuggets um, in these like smaller spaces uh, with the speakers and their um, content. But then we had these big um, kind of bookend speakers like uh, Dr. Barbara Sattler, who, uh, was the keynote talking about the theme of climate change. We had um, Dr. Benner in there, which was like, whoo. Rock star. Right? <laughs> we were like totally starstruck. Um, so we wanna talk about some highlights from uh, her session, um, the faculty meeting. And then we also had um, uh, the Deborah Spunt lecture, which is always, in my view, again, my perspective, always a home run. Um, And this year we had Dr. Kim Layton. So it was, um, again, some of these real big minds in nursing education, but even really integrated throughout were some fantastic sessions where people were really buzzing and talking. So um, so where do you want to start? Um, wow, that's, um, how about climate, you know, cause I think climate was really the, one of the overarching topics of the conference. And so it was woven through with the keynote, as you said, but, but even, um, the outgoing president, um, uh, of NLN, the outgoing chair, and then the incoming chair also talked about climate a lot. And there were some sessions that included climate. So for me, that was, um, really interesting, um, because it was woven in, to our roles as nurses. It wasn't just, here we are nurses, let's talk about climate, right? It was like, we have to be empowered to do something and we have the ability to make changes um, with this crisis right now. And it is a crisis. And they did a really nice job, I think, again, showing or weaving in how how we have a role, you know, the impact on our food, um, food and resources, the impact on our water system, natural disasters that are occurring, all things that nurses are already doing, but um, putting it in context of like how we can make a better, bigger impact in those areas. Um, And uh, that was my biggest take home is we have a absolute role in this and we can do this. You know, I agree with you, Jenny. And if I'm going to get like super honest for a minute, that when I went into this summit with the overarching theme of climate change, um, I feel a little overwhelmed by that. I'm like, you know, I try to recycle. I try to remember to bring my reusable bags to the grocery store. And I try to do these little things that honestly don't, don't feel like enough. And that's just like how I can try to manage my home or my personal use of resources. Um, But when I think about even my role as a nurse or nurse educator, I can quickly get overwhelmed. Like, where do I put climate change in the curriculum? Where do I, you know, how do I integrate it into my course and into my lesson plan? I'm being honest, I get completely overwhelmed. Um, 
with that being said, though, that's how I entered into the summit. But after I heard the yeah. keynote, um, Dr. Sattler, I was pretty fired up. Um, I really felt like, you know what, we really can collectively, I think, unify our voices as nurses and as nurse educators, because she made this beautiful point, which you just made also, which is we are a huge voice and we know this stuff. Mm -hmm. We know health, we know illness, we know environments, we know resources, we know nutrition, we know mm -hmm. physiology, right? Like we know this stuff and we like live it and breathe it. And I felt, I really walked away feeling like as a profession, as an educator, like I could do something more Absolutely. professionally. Yeah. Um, so I, I hope that inspiration is enough to, in all of those people that heard that message um, is enough um, to bring us forward a little bit. Well, I think the standing room, uh, you know, we all stood up right after she presented and was just like, wow, yeah, we have a lot of work to do, but we are fully capable of doing this work. Um, you know, sometimes when you hear people talk about climate, it's a lot of doom and gloom. And of course, you need that. You need to understand the doom and gloom. And we are on this downward trajectory. But it was it was, you know, she took that and she really, again, empowered us in my in my that was my feeling, empowered us to be engaged and involved in this process. And I, I know 1,200 people in that room like stood up and were like, okay, we can do this. Um, so yeah, so it, that was a um, pretty cool moment in the conference. I think so too. And you know, the NLN also um, recently published a vision statement on climate change. And as you said it, um, the NLN chairs in, yeah. incoming and um, Outgoing, uh, they they kept bringing up climate change. Uh, Dr. Malone, yes, yes, made a very clear statement, a lot, and it really aligned with the vision statement, which is published and written down that a committee of experts have created. But it pretty much said, "That's it. We right. we need to do something. Enough is enough." enough. Right. Take <laughs> and action. so it's kind of yeah, it's more of a take action and and you know this theme actually of of we need to stop doing this and start doing this, like a very directive, strong statement of this is what needs to happen. That theme can, maybe that's part of what made this summit, I think, memorable yeah. is we had people like Dr. Benner also doing the same thing and Dr. Kim Layton, which we'll talk about some of their highlights too, but there was a very clear resounding, we need to do this thing, whatever the thing was. And there was <laughs> lots of things, but we need to like, there was authority in the room yeah, yeah. Um, on many different occasions, which I appreciate because I think that authority in nursing, we are hearing it. I'm not sure that other people outside of our profession hear it enough. And I think if we can keep giving that our voice, that authority among within our profession, we yeah. can also start putting it more outward Absolutely. Um, in policy and other arenas where people mm -hmm. really need to hear what what nurses have to say because we know what we're we're talking about yeah we need to be part of the conversation yeah and I and I don't know if that's been happening right I mean it could be but um but yeah nurses need to be at the table of these policy conversations because again we have the knowledge uh and and the number the size of us to to help make change so yeah I also have another confession that I brought <laughs> up in a in a circle of conversation we had that I always felt like, this is really terrible. I'm going to say it though. I always felt like somebody else was doing policy. Like somebody out there, someone smarter than me, someone more motivated than me, someone who's got the skill and the understanding of politics and government, that there was this magical group of nurses that are doing policy. And it's not me. I don't know. You're don't not know alone in feeling that. So, um, you know, fine. So I actually teach a policy course. I teach doctoral <laughs> students in policy. That's why your face was like, my institution. Oh, no. um, But I also have to admit, I grew up in Washington, D.C., where I was surrounded by policy 24-7. But um, that aside, you know, I, nurses don't realize that they're they're involved in policy every day in their roles. Right. You're working on the unit and you find a process that is not working for you. Well, what do you do? You know, you bring it to the attention of people and maybe you rewrite the protocol. Well, that's policy at a very basic level. 
you know? And so I, I know the, uh, my first lecture on my course is policy is not a dirty word. It's actually, um, it's, it's a great thing. It's easy to get involved in and you're probably already doing it. Um, even, you know, in your role as faculty or staff nurse or even our students are getting involved. So, um, you know, you're not alone in thinking that, but I do, I do think nurses need to understand that we are a significant party um, and people and we have a strong voice and we just need to really use that more effectively um, in some of these situations. Well, Jenny, I really appreciate your reframe as you were saying that, you know, that nurses do do policy uh, every day um, in our, our work environments and uh, in our roles. And I was like laughing. So I had this uh, like sincere aha moment. I was like, oh my gosh, I do do policy. I'm like the policy. I'm like, where's the policy? Something's happening on the unit. Exactly, like, where's the policy? Right? There's gotta yeah. be a policy. Yeah. In my office with students, I'm like, what's the policy? Get the policy, Google the policy, get the policy. It, like, so I totally get it. Um, I never, I don't see that as big policy. I see that as maybe little policy. It's micro policy, but you know, you gotta start somewhere. I'm not, I'm not, we're not trained um, until start lobbying is like the first thing we do in nursing, right? Um, to run to Washington, DC. But if you can start to engage in these micro kinds of policy things, and then, you know, um, you get confidence to move on to, to the next things in your community or in your nursing organization. So it's got to start somewhere. That's great. So now that I know I have a friend in policy, um, next time you go to DC, bring me with you. <laughs> go storm the yeah. White House. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm at the Watergate. You can pick me up there. Um, all right. So I think um, another pretty big conversation we heard, um, which was led by Dr. Kim Layton. Yeah. Um, at the, as part of the Deborah Spunt lecture, mm -hmm. um, it was, there were so many, um, really wonderful things and, and people were applauding her yes <laughs> continuously throughout her her talk because mm -hmm. i think again she was speaking with authority she was saying we need to stop doing this and start doing this over here one example which is probably a pretty silly example but was when she pulled out the whole tuning fork example like can oh, we yes. stop teaching <laughs> the tuning fork like <laughs> putting it on your head um yes, an assessment. We, don't, we don't have to do the eye assessment the ear assessment as basic assessment skills if someone yeah. and she equated it to you know we should be spending time teaching really good blood pressure assessment and she gave this great example right where when she gets her blood pressure taken and the cuff doesn't fit that instead they just move the cuff down to the smaller part of her arm and she's like uh no that's not how it works but we're not even doing a good job teaching those basic like assessment skills that you should be able to do vitals for example and anyone right but how often are you as a as a new grad or even an experienced nurse on a med search floor going to look in someone's eyes and ears um it's yeah that, that was funny we were we were laughing quite a bit with those examples <laughs> but it was good it was like we need to really rethink what we're teaching, how we're teaching it, why we're why, teaching it. Why, why we're teaching it, right. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you know, Jenny, there was another um, highlight from her talk about uh, really, I think, celebrating the simulation guidelines of best practice, mm -hmm. um, and then talking about how we can translate that into other areas of nursing education. Um, can you share a little bit about your thoughts yeah. on that? Because you had some really good ideas. Yeah, so, and you know, you and I are a little bit biased because we come from the simulation world already. So that's like the hat we take into every conversation. And, um, but, and, and she certainly has done um, a ton of work in simulation too. But she, what she really talked about is we have now these standards that are embraced by people in simulation. And that's not just nursing, because um, I work in interprofessional simulation. And I know you have too. And these are standards that are being embraced by medicine and other disciplines as well as really these standards. But she she really asked a, a good, great question, like, well, what are the standards in clinical practice that we're using um, to standardize practice for our nursing students? And, you know, why don't we have these standards? And 
what can we learn from the ANASCO standards, um, the healthcare standards of best practice that we could apply uh, to create clinical practice guidelines. And I was like, wow, that's a really big aha. It, like, yeah. And it, it, it's also interesting to me that we haven't had these in practice, but we've practiced as the gold standard. We, we constantly, right? And, it, and then we start comparing practice to simulation. Well, why are we even doing that in the first place? Practice, we should know if practice is good. And if it has standards, then we would know it's good. But we haven't done that. So, you know, those are really some good ahas for me that we have something from simulation we can use in practice. Um, but let's stop saying, can we replace clinical with simulation? And just let's create different ways to teach our students that are all evidence-based and um, follow guidelines and standards. Seemed, it seemed like so easy, but why are we doing that? One of the most, I think, basic things that I know I have learned to do, but I didn't learn it by reading a standard of clinical education. I learned it by mentors sharing best practice with me um, in teaching. And just by experience, kind of messing it up and saying, well, that didn't work. But when I was uh, doing a lot of clinical education, clinical instructor with learners, especially in acute, in acute care, mm -hmm. is starting with just learning outcomes for the day, yeah. right? Instead of just taking, because how I was taught initially to do clinical was to take my eight learners, like little ducklings, and take them into the, the clinical right. um, setting and say, come on. So the first thing you have to do is knock on the door and introduce yourself. Go ahead, go ahead. And that was like the whole, I mean, I just kind of said, just go, you have to go learn to be a nurse, do what right. a nurse does. And that was the whole day. So whatever that, that included soup to nuts, that included doing all the assessments and all the care and all the bed baths and the, you know, um, mobility uh, or I, I should say ADLs, activities of daily yeah. living, right? Mm -hmm. And doing medications and telling me all, all of the medications and all the, you know, the five rights. And so, but then I learned that all of that is just too much, especially when you're trying to scaffold and, and level your learners and, and inch them toward um, this idea of, of competence and and um, and confidence in their practice. So I, you know, started saying today, we are doing auscultation day, and our learning outcome for today is auscultating. <laughs> All things auscultation. We're going to listen to bellies and lungs and whatever we can auscultate, you know. And there might be other learning outcomes as well. But you know, I stopped doing the let's do everything a nurse does every single day. Um, because that was just too overwhelming. So, yeah. And something that I started doing, and I have to admit, I haven't been on the floor with undergraduate nursing students in quite a while, but this whole concept of like pre-brief that we, again, we use and we embrace in simulation and we know it's essential that it sets the tone it sets a safe learning container and it threads throughout the simulation. Um, and we need to be doing that in clinical too, right? So the, what I would do is I would send my students to get report with their primary nurse because I always wanted them to be engaged in that primary report process so they under, start to understand what it is to be a nurse and what that whole day looks like. And but how to process I, all that information. All that information, right? <laughs> and, and, and they probably understand this much, but they need to hear it. Um, and it gets them to start asking questions as well of, of their preceptor and, and or their nurse and, and our, our faculty. Um, but then I bring them back, right, individually, not as a group, but I bring them back and say, okay, give me a report now. What are your priorities for the day? You know, what do you still have to find out about your patient? Um, and it's, it's said, like, here's, you know, said, tell me what your agenda is um, for the day. And I think it, it helps them build some confidence. It's that safe container with me to say, I don't know what, what I just heard in that handoff, <laughs> please explain. Um, but it, it really gives them a moment rather than just pushing them in a room and saying, go, well, go do what? <laughs> um, and then I also say like, you know, don't wait till the end. I wouldn't wait till the end of the day with my students to debrief and in that post-conference, which some of those post-conference aren't even debriefs because you're so exhausted after eight or 12 hours. But so find those moments during the day to debrief with your students. Um, so you're giving the medication dose, um, spend more than two minutes just 
pulling the med out of the drawer, but really dig deeper into conversation around what's, why are they on this medication? What are the contraindications? And taking more time to debrief in the moment, I think is um, a really, again, it's something you can borrow from simulation. Absolutely. And, you know, and especially if, if um, in a teaching hospital, we would have rounds, interprofessional rounds, and yeah. I would ask um, the rounding uh, team if we could listen in as, you know, the, as le the learners, um, and they always welcomed us. And so the, the nursing students would listen to the rounds. Um, they, sometimes they would even get pulled into the rounds, which was yeah. like big stuff. But then we would debrief after that. So it's it's just doing these little activities. So that that IPE rounding, either their observation of it or their participation in it, became an activity in and of itself with its own learning outcome. And then we debrief that learning outcome, and that's a way of evaluating that learning outcome. Mm -hmm. um, what is the nurse's role in, in in an interprofessional rounding for that's centered on the patient plan of treatment for the day? That's like a really big deal in and of itself. So we have yeah. to really start learning how to acknowledge those opportunities, create them, um, design them ahead of time, have some things in our pocket that we can do, um, evaluate them formatively. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and really all of that, again, comes back to standards of best practice, right. of best right. practices of teaching and knowing how to create learning opportunities and debrief and dialogue these learning opportunities to bring the thinking to the forefront. And we heard um, Dr. Um, Layton talk about that. And then we heard Dr. Benner talk about that. Like she had, Dr. Benner had so many mic drop moments where we're just like, yes, like say it again, please. Um, well, let's just paint the picture too to those who are listening, right? I know. So we had to get our onstage moment with Dr. Benner. So before she even presented, uh, Michelle and I, along with two of our colleagues, asked permission for Dr. Malone if we could go on stage and get a picture. And we did. And yeah, pretty like, I mean, she is my superstar. Um, I mean, I, I my whole dissertation was around Benner, you know, a lot about Benner and I teach my students about just like, oh my gosh, what an incredible moment. I put it on my LinkedIn page and everyone was like, you got to meet her. She's my hero. I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> you really do feel like you're in the presence of greatness. And yeah. I'm not even being like cheesy. Like you really do feel like there's something really, really phenomenal um, about her work, about her presence, about, um, I, I don't know. It was just. Yeah, it's just, you can't even ex ex describe it really, right? <laughs> that it was like, wow. Um and her, you know, her, she really dug in deep. I mean, she is very um, thoughtful and, and sometimes I, I wasn't sure even what she was saying because she's so like up here and, you know, theory-based, which is awesome. But I mean, like, so above, I was like, oh my God, I need like a mom, I need to focus. What did you just say? Because I got to write that down. Like, oh my gosh, like everything from start to finish was so important. Um, and I know you and I, we hope to go back and be able to watch the, the video and like take notes because it was like a lesson for me. Uh, I felt like a it, student. It was. And you do feel like a student um, because not only do I feel like I need it, I, I need to like re-listen to her yeah. words again, but then also I need to read her work and make other connections um, in a more thoughtful way because of the things that she says are, are really so important. Um, and again, she's another one, a leader that spoke with authority and said, all right, everyone, this is what we need to be doing. And people listen, like people were there and the, people were immediately on board. Um, if I could make an assumption by the way, people were applauding and, and, um, really feeling the excitement in the room yeah, to get absolutely. to hear from her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and she, you know, I know you and I talked about this. She, she talked, um, about, this idea of writing, having students write like a, a personal reflection um, on things that they observe and, and experienced. And um, she shared this experience of a student uh, or nurse, actually, I believe it was a nurse um, who um, their patient uh, had um, 
bowel obstruction, I believe it was. And, you know, the nurse was going to have to, they found out on change of shift, they were going to have to go and put an NG tube into this, you know, poor older patient that was miserable. And she, the first thing she thought of was like, oh no, I don't want to do that NG tube. And, and then she heard the report and it was like, well, the patient's refusing. And she's like, yes, I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times did that happen? Right. I, not me. I don't want to do that. Um, and, and, but then she, you know, quickly found out that the patient had agreed um, I believe that was what it was or she, right. Or did she, Well, I think the nurse, you know, realized that the patient continued to have such terrible symptoms. And yeah. then she made the connection in her knowledge of physiology that these symptoms are coming from the lack of, you know, of, of the, or because of the drainage, um, the stomach content increasing. So the NG tube would alleviate ultimately the suffering that the patient was going through Meanwhile, initially she started by thinking that the suffering would be from the NG tube itself. Right. But That's realized, true. you know, and kind of had to do this reconciliation of, you know, based on what I think might be miserable versus what actually might help this person, you know, get over this hump of acute illness to the other side. And all of that was unpacked in a first person narrative in writing. Yeah. Yeah. And how so much of this art um, and this this opportunity is lost when we don't ask our learners to do this kind of reflection um, to unpack how they're internalizing their nursing practice. It's yeah. one thing to just say, you know, to be up and in front of an in an auditorium with learners and say bowel obstruction, and here's how here are the symptoms. Um, here they're all categorized, they're listed, here's what we do to treat it. But then to really have this learner go in there and experience what a bowel obstruction looks like, what the, the nausea and the pain and the, the discomfort, the, the abdominal distension, and then internalize and, and really use her prior knowledge of physiology to then yeah. make a change, that's tr it's just tremendous. And, and we I think in nursing education, we've lost a little bit of that because you know, what's really interesting, you know, the pendulum swings right. all the time. Sure. And our mentor, Sue Frenaris, talks about this all the time. Like it just swings back and forth. And here we are again, where Dr. Benner is saying, we need to be having our learners doing these first person narratives to explore this, um, these, these processes and this learning. When I was in nursing school in the early 2000s, um, we journaled and journaled and journaled. We journaled our heads off. And I know this because I went up into my attic and found <laughs> your journal <laughs> buckets of nurse wow. of my journals as a nursing yeah. student. And yeah. I was reading them and they're very touching. You're like, wow, I really was, you know, feeling overwhelmed or scared or, you know, nervous. Um, and it's kind of palpable. So, and then I went into teaching and we were, I was not, we were not doing reflections or journal. We like had right. journaled, journaled ourselves out. And now <laughs> we went a decade with no journaling. And now here we are again, maybe doing some first person narrative. Maybe we need to stop calling it journaling. Yeah. Maybe that's too, I don't know. We need a, a new word, something <laughs> really sexy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Something to get students to not think of it too as, as an, another exercise that they have to do. But, you know, I think about that, that example as, as reminding us that it's so important to be present in the moment with your patients. And really, you know, we all have our own anxieties and, and um, fears in practice, but really trying to put that aside and focus in the moment on the patient. And in that case, it wasn't about the end, putting an NG tube in, which was what she was initially focused on. And she moved away from that through the narrative that she shared, but it was the whole picture, right? It was, well, the patient's feeling um, crappy and like, you're going to hopefully give her some relief and, um, and you're going to give her comfort in that moment. And you're, you're going to be there with her in a very vulnerable moment for that patient. And then it's about, you know, why would she be having a bowel obstruction and what things go into that? And it's, it's this, you're painting a big picture and you're seeing it not again as a skill, but as a person and an experience. And then that's our role as faculty, right? Ultimately we want the students to take that experience and move from that one patient to apply it in other contexts. I mean, that's, we're not just focusing on the moment or I, I believe, what does she call that um, category? We're like, 
right? Subsuming. So we have to stop subsuming things under in categories. In categories. Really right. 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 And really, again, then getting them to think, okay, beyond this moment too. How can we take what we learned and apply it? Um, so yeah, I mean, she, but she challenged us. She really challenged us, I think, in that, in that presentation, um, on again, things we still, we still have to do. And I think, you know, back to what, when did she release her original, um, paper, like 2010, I think about changing the paradigm of, of, you know, nursing. And, uh, I think we still have some work to do. <laughs> so I think she um, said as much too. I think she said, yeah, no. Because somebody asked, I think, how maybe hopeful she was. Oh, right. They said, where are you? <laughs> and she was like, well. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. said, there, there's more to do, you know. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, I think in summary, you know, we provided some highlights uh, for three huge, um, again, brilliant minds in nursing education, um, doing really wonderful work or, mm -hmm. you know, had, having had done wonderful work and then just keep resurfacing it for all of us that are just um, either coming into nursing education or just feel like we need um, to revitalize our teaching practice. And um, so it was a real treat. And we hope by sharing this conversation, um, that we were able to, if you weren't able to attend Summit, that you could um, maybe get some of the nuggets that we experienced and we can share them with you um, to inspire your, uh, your teaching practice um, and, and your learning environment. Um, I, you know, and, and hopefully we can continue um, to be inspired, I think, throughout this next year um, until we can meet again at the next Summit, um, which would be great. Yeah. And, and, and as a reminder, we're wrapping up the NLN um, year of the nurse educator um, and, you know, NLN's done a fantastic job putting more emphasis on um, us as educators and the, the work we have to do. And, the, but to acknowledge like the stress we've been under. And um, so for me, this, this conference, like, was that, was that, yes, now we've been celebrating us the whole year. And it was like this, we are amazing. We need to, um, you know, be rewarded, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but but it, we were recognized and then I think that was really important. Well, thank you, Jenny, for uh, joining in on this conversation. And um, I look forward to continuing to experience these uh, mic drop moments with you and, and many others. Yes, me too, Michelle. Take care. Thank you for joining us on this episode of NLN Nursing Edge Unscripted Surface. We hope you join us next time. Until then, remember, whether your water is calm or choppy, stay connected, get vulnerable, and dare to go beneath the surface.